Gerald um, in connection with this exhibition that we're uh, sitting in, um, Wendy Walls, uh, This is Where I Live. So we're really excited to have this exhibition here. We're really grateful to have the panelists here. And I'm just going to turn it over to them. Thank you for being here. perspectives could help us grasp the unbearable complexity of this place and its voices. So um, Nolan is first, and um, he will tell you a little bit about his name for me. Thanks. So hi, I'm Nolan. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, okay. I guess I think about my practice uh, as sort of an expanded photographic practice because I work in social practice and in public art and in various community-based projects, but photography is always a large element of what I'm doing. Um, and this first slide is a project I did about a book collection of children's books in Brookings, in a public library in Brookings, Oregon. And the book collection is there uh, because of um, a Japanese man who's no longer alive named Nobu Fujita, but he served in World War II and he was a fighter pilot and he actually dropped the first bomb that was ever dropped on the United States soil that happened to be outside of Brookings, Oregon. Later in his life he became a pacifist and reconnected serendipitously with some people from Brookings which started a relationship with the town and eventually bequested a thousand dollars of his own money towards a library collection that was to be of children's books about other cultures um, and the idea was that it would be an educational resource so that future generations could avoid, potentially avoid acts of war. So I documented that story and the collection, which is still in circulation in Brookings, and uh, then had an exhibition of the photographs in the Portland Public Library and worked with librarians to curate a collection of books to um, be displayed with the photographs that were in line with the original mandate of the Brookings collection. Um, how do we switch slides here? <laughs> this is another project that I work on with Harold and another artist named Molly Sherman. Um, this was in a small town in rural northern France um, where there's the Matisse Museum. And this is some, uh, the Matisse Museum is there because Henry Matisse, the painter, was born in this small town. Uh, but he didn't really live there, he was just born there. So our project dealt with people who had also been born in this town. And uh, from all walks of life, we made a short documentary about those people and then it culminated in an exhibition um, of small personal museums within the Matisse Museum about each person. And these personal museums were made up of significant objects from those people's lives and a recreation of the signage that was outside the Matisse Museum. But in this case, it was a photograph of the person and quote by them. Um, yeah, and so that's a still from the video at the exhibition shot. 
And then I wanted to mention that uh, when I was in graduate school several years ago, I was able to make a book and interview Wendy Ewald, which is um, the exhibition I'm standing in. And uh, I'm just going to pass this book around in case anyone's interested. And uh, it's available at the publication studio. Thanks. two images um, to speak briefly with you about today. This first image is a Fred Wilson um, piece called Minors from 1995. And this, I think, encapsulates really most cleanly the way I think about the relationship between the photographic and its potential to um, uh, essentially catalyze the way we represent or understand what's real. And so uh, my work, if you didn't know, if you don't know about my practice, is mostly interested in the politics of difference um, and how those affect our relationships to race and So what I really love about this image and the reason I'm using it as a segue into this discussion today is that it uses you know, sort of the photographic or the thing that we accept or understand as real um, with the objects that we actually encounter most often in society in terms of how we interact and think about race, identity, and stereotypical representations of blackness within the United States. Um, images like this alongside, um, can I have the next slide as well, please? Um, this slide here is a stereo stereoscope card, a stereographic representation um, of a, and the caption, if you can't read it in the lower right, lower right corner, is Mrs. Newlywed's New Wench Cook. Uh, wench would be sort of vernacular language for slave or prostitute, depending on the time period um, and location within the world in which you are reading and understanding this information. And this to me is another signal for how the photographic reaches into the way we understand and um, perceive what is, what is real and how we accept and understand it. So my work is sort of a constant navigation between public representations of race and identity and um, the private ways in which those get sort of, what's the word I would choose here, Emily, um, processed maybe or digested um, and then sort of regurgitated back into how I might form or build a practice that tries to understand all of those things. So my work is sometimes social, socially engaged, um, often community-based in, in projects like the project I work on with Harold or Patty or Emily in different situations. So Julie, to his daughter, so we had a project we did together. Um, and then I also have a studio-based practice that navigates these ideas in a much more personal way. So kind of moving between those two camps is how I would think about um, work in general and particularly the role of photography and its ability to affect representation. especially my own neighborhood is was where the idea began. I live in inner North Portland and uh, make them feel comfortable and um, valued and engaged uh, in their own neighborhoods as it was rapidly changing. So I thought of a project uh, where they would meet and interview their neighbors and then I would interview every child who was part of this project. Well, Caldera um, is a program that I worked with for a long time, and they backed me and got a grant from the NEA. So I ended up with one, um, you know, the idea was small to begin with, but I ended up with their support uh, working in uh, 11 communities across Oregon. I've continued that kind of work uh, for years and years. Um, some of these were made into large-scale photographs, not unlike Wendy Ewald. I always call Wendy the mentor I've never met. And um, I've always been incredibly grateful to her because when I started first doing um, photojournalism, I started at Willamette Week and I started writing on my photos. I think uh, um, I didn't discover Wendy's work till much, much later in my career when a, an assistant I had said, oh, you are inspired by Wendy Ewald. I'd never met her and never seen her work. But then her work started validating my work and um, I started to be able to uh, tell people more often, like, look, kids can do this, because oftentimes kids in photography was not something people would readily buy into. And so um, I've been working really strong, um, quite a bit with children for over 20 years, 
But now my work has expanded into doing projects that are still collaborative, but m with more community base, I, a broader community base, I guess. And so what started as Hello Neighbor, so on the left is uh, Michael Fletcher. And um, if you can't read the text, it says, I wish we could have a community fair slash barbecue. Remember the ribs. And um, so he was 11 when he was in the project. And he was one of our, um, my favorite kids. Anyway, he, he uh, interviewed a lot of people. And he had a large scale banner. Um, forward to February of this year. And I'm still friends with my guy. I still know him as an adult. He's a student at PSU. And now he was part of a project I did, I am still doing, called Messages to a President and Messages to a City. So I set up a photo booth, photograph people, um, and uh, have, hand them a print. They write a message to either our current president or the city, depending on where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, so I photographed over 700 people so far. So this was his, um, since November, and this was his message to uh, President Trump in February. Um, what, what is interesting to me, um, especially about not only this collaboration that spanned 10 or 11 years and watched him grow from a child to an adult, is that he's also the person who survived. Um, if you know about the Max incident that happened uh, at the end of May, he's the young man who um, stood up against um, injustice and was stabbed but he's the only survivor. So um, that's that story. And I just continue to do my work in the community, and it's called social practice. I've always called it community-based art, but I fully embrace everything everybody's doing, and I'm super happy about it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And I just wanted to ask everyone to continue to speak loudly, because we have, coming from the outside, ear cheers. <laughs>
happen that I'm gaining from making this work? Because it's, it's evident that she's not gaining the same kind of social capital, and she will never be, because just of the way society is structured. And I can't change that um, as a single artist trying to do my work, but I could be responsive and mindful about those dynamics. So that this issue of reciprocity has been in my mind for uh, a while. And, um, and the way I started to think a lot about um, how to give back or how to share a little bit of that social capital is that um, that sort of response, that reciprocal response, for me has to be, in order to make sense and have meaning, has to be very side or context or relationship specific. And this also comes from like observing how in doing uh, documentary work, for example, it's very standard for um, photographers, for example, to think, oh, I am, I am taking images of, let's say, a marginalized community in some place in the world, and then the way I give back is by uh, printing, making a print and giving it back to people, which is, I, I think, like a very nice, funny response, but when it becomes a formula, for me, it starts to see meaning, because it doesn't speak about the specific relationships that were built while doing that work. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how to actually bring that that idea of reciprocity into the artwork, how to build it into it, not necessarily as an afterthought, but like bring it into the work um, as like a very important component. So one of the things I did with this work, with this woman, is that she writes a lot. That's something that she's been doing as a, as a way to cope with the hardships of being in the US. And uh, so what we did after the project was to, I helped, because I facilitated the creation of a book. So we worked together in making a book that compiled all her writings. And then we uh, made a book public, mainly uh, through her circuits in places that she cared, including her small rural community back in Veracruz, Mexico. Um, so this idea of like sharing social capital and how to also use a whatever access, whether it is small or big, uh, to certain spaces and to certain resources uh, to try to um, make some fissures in there to open space for um, the people that I'm working with in projects. So that's just some of the thoughts I have in relationship to images and social engagement. Thank you. Hi. 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 I'm Harold Fletcher, and um, I, I'm the director of the Art Social Practice Program at ASU. Actually, I think in one way or another, kind of collaborate with everybody on this panel and over the years in various ways. Um, a little louder, please. Okay, yes. Thank um, you. Wendy Wall was somebody that was really uh, instrumental to my development as an artist that I ran across when I was a student of uh, Portraits and Dreams, the first book. And, and this is her, in a lot of ways, I think, my development as uh, somebody doing social practice and developing the, the MFA program was based a lot on Wendy's work. And I was lucky enough to, to meet her at some point, um, and then we decided to collaborate on a couple of projects, actually a series of projects over three years at Amherst College, where she was a visiting artist. And so for each uh, fall, I would go out there, and we would work together with Martha Saxton, someone from the Women's Studies Department, and a group of freshmen who were part of a freshman or inquiry class that they were teaching. And the focus of the class was to examine and produce work related to campus sexual assault um, from a really sort of broad perspective. And Amherst College was one of the colleges that was sort of identified early on as having a problem and was as attempting to address that in various ways. So this was sort of part of it. So this was um, a publication that we made from the first year that we worked together there on this, and this was part of a debate that we set up between students and community members, faculty, staff, um, talking about different aspects of, of sexual assault we go to the next slide. The next year, oh, this is a little out of order. Um, actually, can you go to the next? Uh, next. Okay, the next year we did uh, work with a different group of freshmen, and th in this case created sort of like a five-day conference in which students led um, their own sort of autonomous discussion panels and events all over campus, also sort of addressing this, trying to um, sort of get it out into the, the broader campus life. So so like sports teams would do projects and um, dorm, dorm um, areas would do them and all sorts of things like that. And then uh, if we go back one, then the third year we expanded and also worked with the uh, Hampshire County Jail and brought students in uh, from Amherst as part of an inside out course and then worked with a set of inmates and, and we're, we're addressing um, the 
there's a similar topic, but sort of with the intersection between uh, incarceration and, and colleges and, and, and the, the, all those topics and how they're connecting and overlaps with that. And then if you go to the next one, the, that same year we also did a sort of wrap up project to the, um, for Amherst and created this handbook that the students um, developed themselves that was then distributed to all of the students on the campus that uh, once again sort of addressing um, sexual assault from a variety of different angles but um, was then given out to all the students and all the incoming freshmen so that they would sort of have this as a resource. And along the way, Wendy was doing collaborative photographic projects with the students, and, and we were putting on these events and doing various things, so that um, it was this large-scale collaboration and a, a really great experience um, for me and sort of a fulfillment of this um, earlier connection that I had to Wendy's work. I brought along um, the three of the, the newspapers, so I'll maybe just pass this Actually, I can leave them here uh, and put them on the resource table for later if you want to check it out as well. Thanks. So those are our panelists. Um, I really, you can see that I didn't want to just select people that identified as photographers. It was really important to me to um, have a panel that was representative of people that were thinking of this meeting of the visual and the social. Um, and all of these people have practices that are very collaborative, so that was also important. And I think that when we have a panel of photographers, it's often um, the conversation goes one way. And so I really wanted to have a panel of people to have this discussion that we're thinking about imagery and thinking about representation and thinking about collaboration and thinking about ethics. Um, and so I have a lot of questions. I will try to not ask them all so everyone else has time to ask questions. Um, but um, we'll just go ahead and feel free, all of you, to chime in at any point. Um, so I'm going to sit down for the questions. Uh, so I, one question I've been thinking about a lot is um, kind of the artist's function in community or art's function in community. So I was hoping that we could talk about that a little bit. Um, what is the function of art or an artist's function in community? What is the function of art or an artist's function in community? What's the <laughs> We've all decided. <laughs> well, okay. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't think that there's any sort of like absolute to that, and, and or you know, single single answer to that. Um, I think that art has the capacity to function in all sorts of different ways that can include. Being very private and or can be commercial and function within the gallery system. And then I think for, for some artists, they, they want to be able to use their, their work and their practice to collaborate and engage with, with other people. Partly because, at least from my experience personally and, and work that I've done with, with others, including with Wendy, I think is that it gives you a chance to learn while you're, while you're making. Work by, by working with other people and by working in social settings that aren't neutral. I think that you know, oftentimes we think about artists wanting to make their work in a studio, a sort of neutral studio, and then put it in a neutral gallery. And um, in in a lot of the work that I've done, it, some of some of it has been in that kind of context, but a lot of the work has also been not in art um, context. And so it's a it's a chance to to sort of break down those barriers that sometimes exist between the general sort of general public and uh, the art world. So for me, it's just a, a fulfilling experience to work in that capacity and to, um, to, to be able to share and, and create participatory collaborative projects. I don't think it's a, a requirement. Uh, I think it's an option that people can choose to do if they want to. But at the same token, um, in any other job could be like that too. So you can, in, in any any profession can have uh, participatory social engagement components to it. It's not just artists that have this as a as an option or potential responsibility. Do you think there's also a particular kind of fluidity that artists are able to sort of engage when working with communities, especially communities that have expertise from like really broad based different sections? Um, artists have the ability to kind of move in and out of these communities in ways that can sometimes build connections that may not formally have been there. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes it's less about you, the artist, and more about sort of this relationship of 
trust you're able to foster or build. Um, I think that is one really powerful way um, that an artist can work. And when I contextualize that with the sort of the larger, broader field of photography, um, that takes on a, a different kind of meaning as well. Um, because photographers, if you think of it, it's sort of like the most traditional way that a photographer has engaged in a community. You're not you're always there, but sort of your your role can be more or less visible depending on what you're trying to achieve within that space. Um, so with Wendy's work, for example, she's really sort of the center, right, from this process. Um, but she, she's still present. And in a lot of ways I think there are a lot of really strong parallels between that and the way we've seen photography as a field develop over time. It's the 30s or something. 1830s. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, historically photography has been, um, photographers have sort of held up a mirror for us to look at ourselves and how we interact with ourselves in society. And I think more and more I see people making work that is more questioning the, the roles within the author and the subject and thinking about the power dynamics that are there. Um, and also taking a more forward position in terms of participating in the subject matter that they might have previously just been documenting and sort of in a removed sort of way. So that there, there's more work where they're taking, being an active agent in, in change or in, in, within communities where they're working. And that's, to me, that's, that's, what I, that's work that I'm really interested in um, that, that goes away from being um, sort of Passive and extractive, and more uh, relational and engaged. And I would just say what I um, what I love is seeing people engaged in a way that uh, affects not just the the one person, but the broader community. So, so for instance, when uh, with Hello Neighbor, a lot of people would say, um, "Well, how does?" how does a child identify which photograph they took that's hanging publicly in a space? I'm like, all 15 of them think they took it, you know? And it makes them feel very empowered to know that 15 children photographed one person, that one person is on a wall, and they all feel a part of it. Ownership was never a question. Not, and I, that's what I loved, is that they can engage, they can, tell the community this is part of, the, you know, their pride just ripples out on a much larger level. And, and when they meet people from that community, then those stories become their story as well. They can tell the story of the person that is in the public um, sphere. And so then, you know, an 11 year old Micah can tell the story of the union iron worker he met that built Big Pink. So that's one of the things I love about the social engagement part of the kind of work we all do, is that it, um, it just is more expansive. It creates a bigger conversation. Uh, I'm just thinking a lot about that, because I, I think I am, I am less interested in thinking about the, 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 the function of the artist in the community as more, like something that works better for me, it's a social function of art. Which is something that I think like, I think a lot about too. Um, and it's more useful for me and for a couple of reasons. I feel like because lately I've been trying to examine more critical, the, the, the concept of community. And I feel like we use that word a lot, but half of the time, I am not sure about who we're talking about when we're talking about the community. Um, and also because, and this is something that's become really clear, uh, I'm currently working at a, at a project with day laborers at the MLK Worker Center here in Portland. A lot of times, um, especially if you are kind of like interacting with um, nonprofits or community-based organizations and the community itself, I feel like there is this expectation that the work that you're gonna do, it's gonna create this, um, it's gonna reinforce certain images about community, about like being harmonious and being homogeneous and, and lack of tension, which I am actually not interested either in because I feel like um, I am I'm much more interested in looking at the individuals that make part of that community and what they bring into creating a collective and, and seeing the places in which they might agree and see the places in which they might disagree. And me as an artist, being also kind of like an actor in that process of like disagreement and agreement. So that's why I was struggling a little bit with the question, was like, oh, yeah, I feel like they did. I think 
thinking a lot about, like trying to stay away a little bit from like thinking about community, but more about the social function of art, which for me also expands the possibilities about what art can do. Um, it can be about one person, it can be about a group of person, it can be a group of people that are not pre-identified as a community, um, or it can be with a group of people that are already identified as a community. Um, so that's just a uh, I think that's great. I mean, I think it is so important to think about what we need by community, what community, and there is that, like, I think so often, especially in documentary and photographs, there's like, it's, they often, those photos often show the disharmony, and the community-based art is like often like reflective of harmony, so yeah, it's interesting to think about. Um, so also on that, to speak to Patti about like, how do you integrate reciprocity into the structure of a relational project is one thing I wanna talk about, and also um, how or what, um, What's the responsibility of the artist to um, share authorship, or not even the responsibility, but how to best uh, integrate uh, co-authorship into a project structure? What was the first part of it? <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking about structures that um, lend themselves to, um, to a reciprocal, have a reciprocal nature that are reflective of the work that you want to do, and also structures that um, share authorship and what's important within that. So it's kind of different. You can respond to whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're none of them. Um, <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. That's it's a great question, and it's one that I'm hesitant. I don't have. I know I don't have a definitive answer. I think it's something that my mind changes on daily. Like the structure within building projects within pre-identified communities or self-identified communities, um, I think this is actually kind of tricky territory because part of that is assuming authorship or understanding of a place you may not in fact understand or your relationship to may be regularly changing. And so I, I guess the best way that I can respond to that is the remaining really open and, and aware of those multiple changing kinds of components within um, the environment with which we're working seems to be really important to me. Um, it's the same way I think about education in general. It's, it's really the same theory that drives the way I think about being a practicing artist in general, and I think we'll get to that based on some of your other questions. But it's, it's a really great question to continually ask myself, I guess, is what I would into that. Um, I, would I, think, uh, I think it's, in some ways, it's about creating a loose enough conceptual structure or form that within which people can, various people who are participating can find a voice or agency within. Um, I think of your project, Emily, People's Homes, which is a project that I participated in last year, um, where Emily and a collaborator identified a group of, or selected a group of other groups of artists to work with individuals in the community, some of the older homeowners in Portland. So it was like, these multiple layers of collaboration. There's a collaboration selected more collaborative pairs who are then collaborating with people in the community. So, uh, and the structure was very open and dialogue driven. And I think um, that, for me, that really worked worked as a form um, and cast a wide enough net and left uh, opportunity for various opportunities to arise. Um, interesting. Different projects require various different kinds of things. And so 
sometimes you have to come up with something where you are offering a lot of structure um, and then allow the participant to sort of fill in the content. Other situations you can conceive of the project together and not have a structure in place in advance. And, and so I think you, you're just always having to kind of negotiate these things, and that's part of the role of an artist doing this kind of work is, is not just sort of coming with a cookie cutter approach, but instead determining it based on all of these factors, which you know are going on that are really dynamic. And the, that's to me the interesting part, sort of like figuring out like what's going to work best. So they're linking conceptual things from the classroom ideas to um, direct experience and, and relationships with people, you know, and meetings, conversations they're having. And I think for me, that's when I've had the most profound it, um, learning experiences when I can make that link between something I'm thinking about in the classroom with something direct and, and identify with the person. And so um, in that way, I. Yeah, it's, I feel like the, cl the classes that I've organized are reflections of my, my art practice. I don't think I could teach something I wasn't interested in. Um, I was asked to uh, do an entire school uh, curriculum on math and photography, which threw me into a massive panic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, then it, uh, and, then it, uh, and then it dawned on me that it could be really interesting to um, discover how a five-year-old looks at angles and shapes and um, the way uh, photography intersects, um, or the way that creating a photograph that they hold in their hand changes their perception from the way that they relate to um, shapes on their playground. Uh, and so I, I just, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but. I just find it all really interesting. I find watching um, how people who are not necessarily educated in photography um, become fascinated and empowered by it. And so it really does affect my practice um, profoundly because they their work inspires mine. So that's the best way. So I have a lot more questions, but I, I'd like to turn it over to everyone else here. And, um, yeah, you had, she had some excellent questions, yeah. by the way. <laughs> some really amazing questions. Um, but so maybe um, if there's other people that have questions, uh, we'd love to hear them. Yes. Have any of you encountered a situation with either an individual or a community where you encountered resistance to wanting to participate or collaborate with you? And if so, how did you handle it? And could you repeat the question? She said, has anyone up here ever encountered a community or a group of people that have um, had resistance to wanting to participate in a project? It didn't yeah, matter. or collaborate. Or collaborate. So, um, Carol and I have a project that we've been working on for a few years now, and um, it's the East Museum of Contemporary Art, or Chaos Mocha. Um, and the, the, there was a very beginning sort of pilot phase of that project, so this is a very roundabout way of answering the question. Um, um, I'm sorry, Lisa, I'm going to stop yes. you. I didn't even hear what you said, but I know what you're but talking about. you know about. what I'm talking about. So can you say that again? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. This yeah. room is very strict. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Should, just because it's such an interesting I, I'll just use my teacher voice. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. How's that? Um, Harold and I have been working on a project for a few years called KS Mocha for King School Museum of Contemporary Art um, at MLK Junior School in Northeast Portland. The very beginning of this project um, we had originally envisioned it working one way, and as it turns out, um, it wasn't so much a direct resistance, it was just that what we thought the kids were going to be interested in or, and respond to, it turns out didn't have any real relevance for them. And so in short, and 
this project, the question, you know, we thought they would love making this work to celebrate their community and put it in a museum. They didn't really know what a museum was. They didn't really live in the community we thought they lived in, right? And there were, so this was a huge kind of opportunity to learning. So the resistance, it wasn't that they didn't want to work with us per se, but it was a, a real education in the sense of like, you think you have this way of connecting with a particular group, um, and in fact, maybe you were you were a little bit of a miss, right? So it was just an opportunity for us to rethink um, and start to ask different kinds of questions. And um, I'm very much in favor of sort of humility within the context of any project that I'm working on. And remaining humble does mean being able to always kind of come back and um, ask different questions. Um, and so that would be an example of a recent time analysis. Yeah. Is that loud enough? I feel like I'm yelling at yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> At least in my, in my experience and my, my assumption about most projects like this, is they're not obligatory. I mean, every now and then there is if you're like doing it in a class setting where they're basically forced to because there's a grade or something like that. In most situations, it's not an obligatory one. And so people are sort of opting in or not in the way, same way as they may participate in like a church choir or a softball league or any other kind of thing that people are sort of choosing to do because they, they're not a professional, but they feel like there's value in participating in it. And so I've definitely run across people who aren't interested in working on a given project, but because it's never been positioned like I'm trying to force them to, if they're not interested, I just don't work with them. And there's plenty of other people to work with. And so like, you, you can just find the people that are interested in working with you. <laughs> What do we care about? Because I feel we 
don't have a lot of time to actually analyze those and, and, and sit with those and understand um, you know, what do we actually care about and where those values are coming from. Are those things that we just absorbed from church or from family and we haven't ever questioned anymore if those actually apply to the work we're doing as artists? Um, so part of it is like doing that work of understanding. And for me, ethics have to be very situational too, Respons responsive to the context. Uh, and that's also why I'm so interested in this work, I feel, because I can use the context as a way to inform every single aspect of my work. Not, also, not only my method, my content, my approach, but also my, um, my ethics, uh, the relationships of reciprocity I want to build, the kind of uh, uh, specific relationships I want to have you know, with the people I'm working with. Um, so they have to respond to that specific situation and to, it's just because the kind of work I do is very relational, it's very based on like duration and taking time to know the people I'm working with. Um, so what do people want to get out of this? You know, what can I um, offer not only as an artist, but also like as somebody who lives in the same society and in the same geographical space? Um, and, 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 and try to figure out how does that translate in terms of ethics. Because I feel like sometimes, especially because I, I work a lot of the intersections of like um, social justice, organizations, community-based, and then sometimes what they call their base, um, or like pushing a little bit about like what they see as ethical ways of working because I feel like a lot of times what they see as ethical is actually very unethical from my point of view. But because people are so used to just function under a set of assumptions about what's right and what's wrong and never take the time to actually examine how that looks like, um, I feel like we end up doing the opposite, especially you know in this context where I work. So I'm really interested on like pushing a little bit against that. It sounds like you have a specific idea about what was unethical and curious. <laughs> so I'm just gonna give you an example. For example, I, I'm working at this uh, worker center in Portland, and which is a place where day laborers gather, and day laborers are one of the most vulnerable and um, sectors in, in the labor force in general in the U.S. everywhere. Uh, and, and for example, one of the things I'm doing is that. Uh, we are, have a screen printing thing going on there. And when I came in, the organization that runs the Worker Center was really interested in reproducing these messages that they were getting from the National Day Labor um, Organization Network, which is the national organization that, um, uh, it's like the, the umbrella organization for all these worker centers, day labor centers, etc. And in talking with the workers about these messages, I realized they don't understand them. The language is convoluted, they don't understand. What does this mean? What dignifies us? What does it dignify us? We have, and, I, and then I realized, okay, I am not interested in reproducing these messages in sweatshirts and t-shirts and posters because the workers here don't understand them. Why don't we do the opposite, in which they create their messages, they want to reproduce and then they say whatever they want to say to the world about what their experiences as workers, right? For me, that runs through this ethical thing because it's like, otherwise, we have kind of like a sweatshop going on here <laughs> where they don't have any decision-making about yeah. what they do. They're just reproducing these messages that they're supposed to represent them, you know, but they come from somewhere over there that they don't have really any connection to. So that's where I'm talking, where I'm like, I'm really interested in pushing a little bit because for the organization, that's a right thing to do because they are the representing laborers in Portland and in the nation. But for me, I see some things there that really don't make any sense. So do, does that illustrate what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I say, you know, these, these things have to be very contextual and not based on a set of assumptions about how I'm supposed to be doing this work, but more like about what makes sense? What kind of meaning I want to create through my work? And how do I use the ethics as, as a way to create that meaning?
you know, sexual assault on campus or race in America or messages to our president where the values or the, what emerges from the people that you're violating with is maybe in conflict with the artist and, or, and the vision that the artist has. And I'm curious if any of you have experienced that where what actually emerges in the co collaboration is in, in conflict with your values or your ethics, but at the same time, it's a part of the community that you're representing. And I'm, I guess I'm curious if that's happened and how you navigate that in a you know, way that also honors the other perspective. Everybody has their own, um, I, I don't dictate at all what they're going to say. Uh, and so it, I'm not conflicted if that's what they, I mean, I, I, I'm just giving them uh, a platform. Like you have something you want to say, I want to hear it. And I'm really, I mean, because I've mostly done it in Portland, uh, as you can imagine, even though I've really gone to a, a large cross section of the community, um, a lot of the messages have been, um, you know, get your act together in some ways. But then there's been a lot of uh, uh, religious. Uh, there's been a lot of people that um, I, you know, I'm not a religious person, and so uh, it's it's you know, I just you want to say God bless him constantly, then that's you know what you're going to say. So I, I mean, it's not. It, there's nothing really. Um, I, ha I have had to convince some people. They they think you don't want to hear my opinion, and um, and so that's been interesting. Those kind of conversations, and and I say I do want to hear what you have to say, and 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 then the exchange happens, you know, uh, through the portrait. Like you know, I'm photographing them and and giving them a print that I hope they find valuable, and then they're giving me back words. Um, to pass on to someone else. And so it's always a valuable exchange, even if I may not agree with them or not. I was just gonna say it really depends on how I think about that, and I be a different answer every time you ask me, most likely. Um, in projects that are really more directly about race and identity politics, I have much less tolerance for things that take up too much of the wrong kind of space, because that there's enough space being taken up by those ideas. And so I have a different kind of resistance um, there. And, and at the same time, it's an opportunity to think about what I am resistant to. Um, in some ways, I think if your work is not kind of undoing something new a little bit, you probably haven't quite hit the thing that's, that's right for you. Um, conflict should kind of be inherent, I think, in a lot of what we do and think about, to be able to think about ethics um, I have to have situations that challenge my ethical positionality towards something. Um, so briefly, I think that's how I would respond. We probably have time for just one more question. And I, you had a question earlier. Do you? Communities wanting or not wanting to participate. And, you know, I, I think you know. You know, it usually comes down to how you approach people, but mostly I think we edit ourselves more and we, we inhibit ourselves when we think about projects. And, and so, um, you know, I've always found that, you know, the communities that I've approached have been, they've wanted to tell their stories. And, um, and then, you know, in our self-editing, I, I think, you know, we also, pardon me, have, have to be, have to be aware of academics. And you know, there's a whole lot of the ethics that you all and we all think about. And and I and we can very easily talk ourselves out of things because of some of the issues that are really important. And so it often prevents us from starting those projects. But. Thank you all.